Okay, so welcome back. We are going to have the talk from Prof Professor Florence Tupin. Uh, I had the, the honor to start a collaboration in the sense that she was uh, uh, in the final examination of a PhD student of mine. And now we all have uh, you know, the joy and the, the honor to have uh, uh, her here as a, uh, a great speaker. Florence Tupin, senior member at Trapoli, received the engineering degree and the PhD degree in signal and image processing from Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Telecommunication in Paris, France, in 1994 and 1997 respectively, and the habilitation is dirigé de recherche, I hope that the pronunciation is good, degree from the University of Rennes in France in 2007. From 1997 to 1998, she was with SAGEM in Paris, France, where she worked on fingerprint recognition. She's currently a professor of image and signal processing with LTCI Telecom Paris, Paris in, in France, in Paris. From 2014 uh, to 2020, she was uh, the head of the Image Modeling Analysis Geometry and Synthesis Team of LTCI. And since 2020, she has been Deputy Director of LTCI. She has co-authored more than 200 papers. Uh, her research interest uh, um, include, uh, um, includes image processing and analysis, especially for remote sensing and synthetic aperture radar imaging applications and the earth observation. Professor Tupin has been a member of several international and national technical conference committees since 2003. She was the chair of the Urban Remote Sensing Joint event held in Paris in 2007. She was an associate editor for a Trapoli Transaction Geoscience and Remote Sensing from 2007 to 2016. She was the, recip the recipient of several awards among the Trapoli GRSS Transaction Prize uh, um, Paper Award in 2016 and the Trapoli GRSS Symposium Prize Paper Award in 2022 for works on speckle filtering. I mean, uh, we should uh, read uh, much more, but I want to give uh, the floor to her. Nothing of this for all our speaker is enough, but I'm going to give the floor to Professor Florence Tupin, and I want to thank again her for being here. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction, but also for the very, very warm welcome in the school. We really appreciate it. Okay, so this afternoon uh, we will talk about uh, SAR imaging. So I don't know if you are all familiar with this kind of imaging, but anyway, in this talk I will first do a very uh, simple introduction about SAR imaging. Okay, about the principle, and uh, then I will show you some uh, very famous application of this kind of uh, images. And then uh, the main subject of my talk would be to, to show you how deep learning techniques can be very efficient to reduce the very strong noise that you have on these our images. I don't know if you remember the presentation of uh, Michael yesterday. He showed the our image with plenty of noise and you couldn't recognize anything, but okay, we can still try to improve a little bit this kind of images and reduce the fluctuations. So there will be, let's say, two parts in the talk. And then uh, we will have the practical work. So I, I will just do the talk in the first part, but of course you can ask questions uh, whenever you like. But then in the second part, uh, with Emanuele, we will do a practical work where you will be able to open images, to have a look to the statistics that we have on these images, and try some uh, processing to reduce uh, the fluctuations that we have on this image using deep learning, already trained uh, deep learning networks. Okay, I just would like to thank uh, some of my uh, colleagues, uh, Loïc Denis, uh, part of the work has been done during the PhD of Emanuele, but also uh, another PhD student, Ines, that I would like to thank also. And you can find the slides 
but also the practical work, I think, and plenty of uh, other algorithm for other subjects on this uh, Git, uh, GitLab uh, link. Okay. Okay, so here is the outline of the presentation. I will first, as I told you, uh, give a short introduction about SAR imaging, then uh, some applications and space missions that you probably already know, but uh, just to show you some SAR images. And then uh, I will, uh, it will be a little bit more technical, but okay, I will try to make it as simple as I can. I, I will try to explain to you what are the statistics we have with SAR images and why it is important to try to take them into account. And then I will show you some deep learning strategies that you could use to improve these images. Okay? Okay, so let's start with a, a very short introduction. So you, you see, you, you, of course, you know very well this uh, kind of uh, illustration, but you, you have two big families of sensor. So the first one is the passive sensor. Typically, you are using the sun illumination and then you are just recording the sun that is backscattered, the photon that is backscattered with, the, with your camera. So it's just like natural images that you could take. Uh, you can also, of course, record so thermic, infrared, radiations. But here we are speaking about this family, which is the family of active sensor, where you are sending some waves. So here you are sending electromagnetic waves towards the ground, and then you are recording what is backscattered by the elements that you have on the ground. Okay, and that will give you some information about the object that you have on the ground. So you are having your own source of illumination. That's really an active sensor, right? Okay, so why people are using this kind of uh, sensor? So they have plenty uh, advantages. So the first one, of course, is that you have an old time sensor. You can use it during night, for instance. Well, you don't really care because you are not a military guy, but that could be <laughs> useful in some situation. Uh, but what is more important is that you, it is an old weather sensor. Because you are using some wavelengths, which are uh, but a few centimeters, let's say, you will be able to penetrate the clouds and you will be able to acquire images, whatever the weather that you have on the Earth. Okay? And that could be very important if you are interested, for instance, uh, on tropical areas, okay, or around the equator, where you have very cloudy uh, weather in some uh, situation. A very important point also is that you have a phase information that will be recorded by the sensor, okay? So you are sending an electromagnetic wave, and what is backscattered is also this electromagnetic wave, so you will have a two information, let's say, the power that is backscattered, that's the images we've seen before. But you also have a phase information. And what is very important is that this phase information, it will provide you some information about the geometry, about the elevation of the points on the ground, or even about the, the movement that could have these points on the ground. So that's a very uh, rich uh, information. Anyway, in all cases, that gives you a very complementary information compared to natural optical images that you may have with Sentinel-2, for instance. But of course, you, you may have some difficulties with star images. And one of them is that you have these very strong fluctuations of the signal. Okay? And that would be uh, the subject of my focus on uh, deep learning techniques. And another point is that you have uh, very strong geometric distortions. That's because you can't have a nadir-looking uh, acquisition. You always have to have some uh, incidence angle, and that will provide you with some geometrical distortion that you will see very clearly on the images. OK, so let's have a look. You have your uh, satellite with an antenna is moving in this uh, direction, which is called the azimuth direction. OK, and it is an active sensor, so it will send some electromagnetic waves. OK? So it sends the radar pulse. OK? So just to give you an idea, you, we have uh, magnetic, electromagnetic waves of approximately 
uh, 10 gigahertz, let's say, which means that the wave length is a few centimeters, right? So then this wave will reach the ground, okay, after some time, and it will be, it will happen different things, okay? So first situation, uh, at the beginning of the, you know, all this area will be illuminated by my uh, antenna, by my pulse. And at first, let's suppose that I have some objects that, okay, do not have any specific uh, behavior and the, the, the wave is backscattered in this direction. So you see that in this situation, you will have no signal that is backscattered towards the sensor. So you will have a black pixel, let's say. But for instance, for this target here, which is in blue, let's suppose that this target has some specific properties, right? And that it's backscattering the wave in all the direction, okay? Like a Lambertian uh, backscattering uh, behavior. In this case, you see that part of the energy will be seen by my sensor again, right? And so I will be able to, uh, that's the red part that is seen here, so I will be able to record this backscattered power that is uh, backscattered towards my antenna, right? So I will have, let's say, a bright pixel for this uh, specific target, okay? If you have any question, you can just ask. Uh, okay, so what is important is that you can know exactly which objects has backscattered which information because you have the time, okay? So. Uh, let's say, if you have sent some signal like that in time, after a certain uh, amount of time, you will have the backscattering of the antenna. Okay, so this part, you will have this first pixel and then this one that will give you the second pixel and so forth and so forth because of the time of backpropagation towards the sensor. Okay, and if you read uh, the backscattering coefficient here, you will be able to say, okay, I first had a road and then a building and then some grass and then a tree and so forth and so forth. Okay, so for each pulse you send, you have a line of your image, right? And then the sensor is moving, so is acquiring a second line and a third line and, and so forth and so forth, okay? So when the sensor is moving in the azimuth direction, it's providing you with many different lines of your image because of the different pulses that you have sent towards the, the, the Earth, right? Okay, so here is the second uh, acquisition and the third one. Okay, and each time you have a line of your image. Okay, but you see, if you just do that, you will have a very bad image. You will have pixels that will be very, very coarse. Because in fact, what they have seen on the ground, what is backscattered, is a very large portion of the ground, okay? So usually uh, what you will do is that you see here my blue target. It has been seen, of course, by the, my first uh, drawing here, but you see it's also seen in the second uh, pulse that I have sent. And okay, it was also seen in the third one, right? So in fact, my blue target, it has been seen by many positions of the sensor, by many pulses that I have sent towards the Earth, right? And what you can do, and it's a very, very nice uh, signal processing method, and it's called the synthetic aperture, you will be able to combine all this signal and create artificially a very big antenna, right? Here, it's just as if you had a very, very big antenna by combining all the positions where you have seen the blue target. And when you do that, it's just as if instead of having, you know, this uh, swath on the ground, which is very big, the green one, it's just as if you had the red one, which is much smaller, much finer, so giving you much better resolution in your image. Okay? So when you acquire SAR images, it's SAR is for synthetic aperture radar, you are improving the resolution by using signal processing and combining all the emitted signal to have artificially a very long antenna and artificially a very fine resolution, right? So instead of having five kilometer resolution, you're just moving to 10 meter resolution, right? So that's a huge factor of uh, improvement. 
Okay, so here you have an example of an image. So my, my uh, satellite is moving in this direction. So that's called uh, the azimuth direction. And in this direction, it is the range direction, the distance direction towards the sensor. And that gives you uh, an image, okay? So you're happy, you have sent the pulses, you have uh, made a nice image, but what do you really have when you have a radar signal? Well, you see, you, you have three different situations. The first one is you just have one image, a single image. So just remember, I have sent uh, electromagnetic waves, so for each pixel, I have a complex number, right? But if you just have one image, uh, usually, you have this complex number, I will call it Z here. What you will do is just take the modulus of this uh, complex number, just like the power that is backscattered towards you. And what you will be able to do is object classification, recognition, labeling, whatever, but you, you are not using any phase information, okay? The second uh, situation is instead of just having one image, you are recording two images, right? So let's call them, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Z1 and Z2. And what happens if you just uh, do the multiplication by the complex conjugate of Z1 and Z2, you will have the phase difference between these two images. Right here, you will have uh, phi one minus phi two, and this uh, phase difference it will give you some information about the elevation of the of all the elements on the ground. Right, so you can see it in this image. Here you have the two image, and if you compute the phase difference between these two image, yeah, it's two different acquisitions acquisition because. It's these two acquisitions you see, they, they have to be separated by some distance, right? They, they can't be too close, they can't be too far away, because if they are too far away, you can't do what I'm talking about. So you, you have some, like, few kilometers less than that, in fact, between the two acquisitions, right? And if you just compute the phase difference. What you will obtain is this kind of uh, information. And you see, it's just like the elevation of the ground, but that is wrapped because you are computing a phase information. So you have a two pi wrapping of this information, just like, you know, level sets on a, when you are looking at map, cartographic maps, right? But that's very interesting because you, you can compute the elevation of the elements on the ground. That's a very uh, big uh, application of SAR uh, imaging, of course. And here, what is uh, this image? It's what is called the coherence, and it gives you an information about the reliability of this image, right? About the fact that the phase, you can trust it or not, okay? That was for interferometry, so you have two SAR images, two complex SAR images. And the polarimetry, this time you have three, uh, three channels. It's, they, they are acquired at the same time this, uh, in this configuration. And this time you are sending waves with different polarization, right? You send a wave with some horizontal polarization and you are backscattering, this, you are recording the backscattered signal either with the same or with another polarization. And that will give you Instead of having just one complex number, you will have a small vector k depending on the polarization that you have used to send the wave and to record the backscattering wave. Okay, so in fact, you have a three dimensional vector of complex numbers, and that gives you a very uh, rich information about the backscattering uh, mechanisms inside the pixel, right? So for instance, you may have this kind of backscattering for this one will be very different from this one. And you can have this, I don't know if you see very well, but the different colors, they are representing the different backscattering mechanisms that have appeared inside the pixel, right? 
is it okay for all of you this different uh, well this free situation so if you just have one channel you are looking at the amplitude image it's just like a noisy image <laughs> noisy optical image panchromatic image uh, if you have two images you have you can do interferometry you have information about the elevation if you are in a polarimetric situation you have a free channel uh, complex uh, information and you have information about the physics inside each pixel, right? So you, you can do classification in a much more accurate way than just having uh, one channel image. All right? So it's the same, but just with some notation. So here, you see you have an amplitude image. So I, I don't know if you... So we see that we have some noise. Well, maybe you don't see it very well. We see some uh, roads and lanes, right, on this image. And you see here you have some trees, and you also see the shadow behind each tree. Maybe you can see on the slide on the, on the website. And here you have some small buildings. Well, it's, it's a landscape image. OK, but anyway, for each pixel here, I am recording this complex number, and what we are looking at here is just for each pixel i, it's just the modulus, well, the magnitude of the complex field, right? Okay, but we can recognize things, but I have just one antenna, and I'm just uh, recording one signal for each pixel, right? Okay, so now what happens if you are in the interferometric configuration? So you see here the phase is not as nice as the one before because you don't see anything, but anyway, uh, I would see you after some denoising. Uh, but this time, okay, you have uh, a, a, a complex uh, information for the sensor one, for the sensor two, and what you are computing is approximately uh, this uh, information, right? Because as I told you, it will give you the phase difference between the two acquisitions because of the complex uh, conjugate, right? Okay, and what happens uh, this time if you have the different... So here, you see, you have two sensors, this one and this one, with a slight uh, difference of incidence angle to be able to do interferometry. And here in the polarimetric configuration, uh, the H and V and V uh, information is to say about the polarization of the waves that you are sending towards the ground. Okay, and usually the KE information is just something like KE for HH, KE for the HV, and KE for the VV, meaning that you are sending a wave that is horizontally polarized and you, you are uh, recording with the horizontal polarization or the vertical polarization and so forth and so forth, right? And in this case, you have this nice uh, color image. That's the color combination of the modulus of these three channels. But the real information you are interested in is uh, what we call the covariance uh, matrix, okay? We which is a matrix, if you have three channels, it's a three by three matrix, right? And all the value inside this matrix, they are encoding some physical information, right? And that's uh, what are the uh, information that you would like to reach when you have a look to your SAR image, right? So I, I will explain a little bit uh, uh, better later. So here, now let's suppose that's the last case. You can have also a combination of polarimetry and interferometry. In this case, instead of having a vector of three value or two value, you have a vector of six values, and you can again compute the covariance matrix, right? Okay, so let's do a small break just to show you some applications and uh, some images so you can see. Uh, uh, so here is the first generation of sensor, right? Um, so here you have the altitude, uh, the, uh, the time you need before you acquire an image with the same incidence angle. Here you have the wavelength, and here, oh, okay. So I fed the, the band of the emitted uh, signal, but you, you, you are not really interested in this information. It's just to say you that the, the resolution of these images, they were between 
10 and 20 meters for each pixel on the ground, okay? Meaning that it's not very uh, accurate resolution. I will show you an image of Paris in, a, in the next slides. But the second generation, you see it's all this sensor, and uh, instead of having uh, this kind of uh, bandwidth, we have much higher bandwidth, meaning that we had much higher resolution. So instead of having 10 meters, we had one meter resolution for the pixel on the ground, okay? So here is an image of an old sensor, and you see that's not a very uh, easily uh, usable image. Right, it's Paris, so I don't know, for those of you who know Paris, you, you, you have the, uh, the river here, okay? You, you, you recognize maybe the Seine, and uh, okay, here you have some famous place with lots of roads. Break. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, you, you have some parks and uh, okay, but it's, it's really like a mess of bright pixels and very dark area, so it's really not easy to really understand where you have buildings. You even do not recognize Tour Eiffel, I don't think so. Do you see it? Do you see Tour Eiffel? Well, you know Tour Eiffel is very big, so we should see it on the same edge. But we, even me, I know where it should be. I, I can't, okay, I, I would not dare. But if you have a resolution of two meters, for instance, here I think, yes, it was Radarsat 2, so second generation of sensor. So you see the Tour Eiffel is here. So at least we can recognize it, okay? And we can recognize at least some shape of buildings. It's still not very easy to do the interpretation of this image, but at least we start recognizing information. And it's even easier with Terrasaric image, for instance. So here you see you have the Tour Eiffel, so this time you recognize <laughs> really the Tour Eiffel. And uh, you can also recognize the bridge, okay, on places, and okay, here also you can recognize what you have here. But okay, for instance, you can analyze the Tour Eiffel and you can analyze the geometric distortion that you have on the Tour Eiffel because, okay, here my sensor is here and it's sending waves in this direction. So he sees the top of the Tour Eiffel before the, you know, the corner between the ground and the starting points of the Tour Eiffel. So he first sees the top of the Tour Eiffel, then the uh, second stage, first stage, and then uh, the corner reflector with the ground, right? Okay. So, but you see, and that would be one of my message, it's very different from the 10 meter image to the one meter image. And the information is very different. And I've seen some of the posters and uh, or even in the presentation of Paolo this morning, you, you see, you take, uh, so usually people take, uh, when you are using Sentinel-1 image, you, you are not having such higher level of information, okay? And it's a very different behavior between one meter and 10 meter uh, resolution for your image, okay? Uh, of course, if you have questions. Some applications, well, you know them very well, but I just uh, listed the uh, land application and maritime application, so I just show you some example. So, SAR images are very useful if you want to study forest. For instance, the clear cut of the forest, they will appear very uh, clearly in these images. You see here, for instance, or here, so that's a very uh, useful uh, sensor to, to be able to do forest monitoring. There are many programs to be able to do that, not really in real time, but uh, as soon as they can. Uh, okay, here is always a forest monitoring. It's also very useful when you have a uh, fluid uh, because you see, because of the water, the water is very smooth. So when you sound the wave, it's just going in another direction. It's not coming back towards the sensor. So it will give you a dark pixel. That's why everything is black here. You see all this black area. It's because of the very smooth water of the inundated areas, right? So it's quite easy to, to detect them and it's very useful 
for flood, but also for disaster, because you are sure to, to be able to acquire images. Even if you have weather, even if you have smoke on the area, you will be able to acquire information. All right, and you, and you also have very uh, nice application with uh, multi-temporal series where you have many different images. So here you see just a color combination on, a, on this uh, a water area, and you see, depending on the time of acquisition, some of the boats are moving, so you have uh, different colors depending on the dates where they have left or come, right? Okay, but as I told you, interferometry is a major success of uh, radar uh, SAR imaging, and you can do elevation models and so forth, and you can also use this kind of data to do a ground movement monitoring. Right? What you see here is the subsidence that you have on Mexico. So instead of using two images, you are using plenty uh, of images taken at different times, and you follow the movement of the ground during time. And you see, I don't know if you have ever been to Mexico, but you will see that some of the buildings, they have a quite strong damage. That's because of this, uh, you see here, in this part of the city, uh, Mexico is really going down, that's the subsidence effect, right? And you can follow it very easily uh, using interferometry differential, interferometry uh, acquisition. Okay? So I, I just wanted to say a few words about these new missions. So uh, SWOT mission, maybe some of you have heard about it, but that's a, a SAR mission with two mods. That's a uh, revolutionary, let's say, uh, new altimetric way, uh, but using really a SAR signal. You see, here you have, you will do interferometry, but with these two antenna. So it's single pass interferometry, so that gives you very accurate information about the elevation of the water. It is devoted to uh, ocean or hydrological network uh, height monitoring because they uh, will be. Uh, implicated in the carbon cycle uh, measurements. And uh, another mission that will be by ESA, which is a biomass mission, and they intend to have a very accurate biomass measurements, thanks to polarimetry, interferometry, but also tomography uh, information. Okay, just to show you that SAR is really important uh, way of acquisition today. Okay, so I move. Do you have any questions about this uh, introduction yet? So I'm just confused a bit about when you showed the image of uh, Paris. Yeah. So this kind of distortion you said that are not existing in lower resolution uh, acquisition? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the geometric distortion? Uh, yeah, geometry distortion. Yeah, it, it's because of the incidence angle of the sensor. No, but comparing to lower resolution acquisitions. Uh, to lower, I mean, you, you even don't see them, in fact, because you see to Refel is somewhere here. They should be existing, right? Oh, but they, oh. they exist, but I mean, in a sense, they, they will cause you less trouble because you, I mean, you will just have, you, you, you've seen, you've seen the, the talk of Paolo this morning urban areas were a spot of bright points. But we, we didn't see really this uh, uh, geometric distortion, but also, the, you see here we have a shadow behind the Tour Eiffel. But if, if the resolution is too coarse, you don't see this effect, okay? So, but if you are working with high resolution images, uh, in, in, on one hand, it's a difficulty for you, but on the other hand, it's bringing you lots of information, okay. right? Okay. And there's any like kind of way to to correct for these kind of distortions? Well, in fact, to correct it, you you would need to know the elevation of the point, right? But it's kind of a, you know a chicken and egg problem. To correct it, you need to know the elevation. But if you know the elevation, maybe you well, I mean. Uh, but, uh, okay, there are some uh, networks that are trained to compute the elevation just using this uh, geometric distortion, right? They, 
you know, they learn, they have a map of the elevation, they have this, uh, you see all the buildings, they are like, uh, you know, just put down in the direction of the sun. So you, you see, the more it's going in this direction, the higher it is, right? So you can train a network to, to discover this information. Yes. Uh, uh, I, yeah, if, if you have information from the other side, of course yes. you have a complementary... Now it is in the ascending geometry. If we yes. use the descending geometry, at the same time, digital elevation model, we can uh, remove the shadowing effect of the Yes, yes, uh, you result. can create like ortho image, let's mm. say, that would be seen from, you know, from above. Yeah, yes, sure. Yes. But you, you have to combine all this information. Yes, yes. But what I wa just want to say is that, okay, the elevation of the object is here in the SAR image if you have resolution under, let's say, three meters, right? So you have to take it into account or to ask to the network to try to discover it or whatever you want, but remember that it's in it. Other questions or? Okay, so let's move to uh, some statistics. Well, my, my point is not really to, you know, to, to give you plenty of distributions. I will show you the distribution, but my main message is just, if you are uh, from the computer vision uh, family, you are used to natural images, be careful, SAR images are very different. Right, that, that's just the point. You, you, I mean, the, the noise is different, the content is different, everything is different. Of course, you can say, I don't mind, I just put everything in my network. You can do that, but maybe you can do a little bit better than that, I would say, right? So here, to illustrate my point, you have on the left a SAR image, polarimetric, but that would be the same with just one channel. And on the right, you have a, an optical image. And you see, so here you, you, you have an example of a completely homogeneous area. So it's only grass, right? But you see that on the left, you have strong fluctuations, right? So it's the same physical uh, information on the ground, if you want, but what you are recording with your SAR sensor is something with lots of fluctuation. And that's inherent to the fact that you have sand uh, waves and that they are backscattered towards the sensor, right? You, you can't avoid it with your sensor, okay? So uh, why do we have this situation? So here is another example. So this time you have the optical image here. And you see, if you take the panchromatic channel, you have a very narrow uh, histogram of the gray level because it's almost the same information for all the pixels of this area. But now if I take the same information in my SAR image, you see, well, that's not good at all because I have a very, very uh, big distribution of pixels. I almost have all the gray levels for the same uh, ground for the same physical information, right? So you see you have dark value, but you also have very bright value, and that's completely spread over all the gray levels. Not, not very nice if you want to recognize object, uh, classify, whatever, right? That, that will be a difficulty for you when you will uh, use the image uh, on the right, okay? So can we have a model at least? for this kind of distribution, right? OK, we, we can't suppress it. I mean, we, we can use the uh, image processing to suppress it. But when you do the acquisition, you can't avoid having this uh, kind of uh, perturbation. But do you have any modeling of this distribution? And the answer is yes. So Goodman, a very long time ago, he was uh, studying coherent imaging. And he derived this model and explained that inside each pixel, Right? You just have one pixel seen by your sensor. Inside this pixel, because you have many small things that are backscattering the waves, uh, and they are not, I mean, your sensor is not seeing just one backscattering element. It's seeing a set of backscattering elements. 
All these elements, they are uh, giving you, you know, an electromagnetic wave, so just like a, a vector in the, in the complex plane, and they add all together, right? And you have the red arrow, which is the resulting information that you have for the pixel. But of course, for the pixel, just, uh, just the next one, you have a slightly different configuration of the backscattering elements, and this summation will end with a completely different red arrow, right? And again for the next pixel, and again and again, right? So you, you, can, you can derive a very nice model by just using uh, uh, the fact that adding uh, many random variables will give you a Gaussian distribution, that's all. And what you will obtain is that you will have an exponential law for the distribution of the uh, modulus of, well, the square of the modulus of the uh, backscattered uh, field. Okay, so I just show you, well, that's the explanation. You have a random walk in the complex pen, and you have the real part that will have a Gaussian distribution, and the imaginary part that also will be a Gaussian distribution, and when you put them together, you will be able to derive the distribution of the phase, the distribution of the intensity, the distribution of the amplitude. Okay, so it's not very complicated. We just don't have time to derive the computation. I just give you the result. So the result is this following. So here you have the distribution of the intensity. So you see the intensity is just like the power of the wave. Okay, you take the modulus, you take the square of the modulus, that's just the power that is backscattered towards the sensor. Right? And okay, and you are, uh, you, you wonder. If you have some reflectivity, so for instance, you have some grass here, so you know this value, that the physical parameter that is characterizing sorry, the surface on the ground, you would like to know how will be distributed the power that you will measure for this specific area. You have this model here, so this one is the one we've seen on the image, that is exponential decreasing. Okay, but if you do some averaging of pixel, okay, so instead of taking one pixel, you do a small averaging of these nine pixels, you will improve the distribution, and the more pixels you will average, the nicer the distribution will become, right? But in all cases, you will have this distribution, so you know it, it's given, you, you can use it in your uh, image processing method. That's the distribution that is written here. So here, L is called the number of look, is the number of pixels that you have average. R is the reflectivity, that's the physical parameter that is characterizing the ground, okay? And you have this distribution. And you see what is nice is that you can use this model, which is called the multiplicative model, which says that, okay, what you are seeing is the truth, the reflectivity, multiplied by some noise, which is called the speckle, and the speckle is distributed exactly with this distribution which are drawn here. Okay, so when you do image processing, computer vision, usually you have an additive Gaussian noise. Okay, so the question here is, okay, here I have a multiplicative noise, how could I go back to my additive noise? A very simple idea is just to take the logarithm. You agree? If you take the logarithm, instead, you, since you have a product, you will have an addition of the two uh, value, right? So here, if you have, you take the logarithm of this stuff, you will have logarithm of the reflectivity plus logarithm of the speckle. So you have a new model, which is just this one the new reflectivity, which is a log reflectivity, if you want, plus the log speckle, right? So you have, now you are back to a usual image processing uh, problem, which is just an additive noise. But just be careful. The distribution of this noise, you see this S uh, tilde, is not exactly Gaussian. You have the distribution here. They are derived from the distribution that you have just above. And you see, it is approximately Gaussian only if you have average lots of samples locally, okay? If you do not do any averaging, you just take your image, you just take the logarithm, and you have a look to the distribution of the noise, 
Well, it's this one. You see in dark blue, it's not really Gaussian. I don't know what you think, but you see it's like dissymmetric on the left. Okay? So just be careful. When you take the logarithm on an image, when you are using SAR images, you are not exactly going back to the usual natural image world. Right? Is it, is it clear for you? Yeah? Okay. So anyway, we can still have an additive noise if we take the logarithm of the image. Okay, here is just an illustration. When you have additive noise, you have uh, your noiseless image. Okay, so that's my air here, uh, plus some Gaussian noise. If you are with a SAR image, this time you have a multiplication. Okay, so here is air, here is S, and here, if you are taking the logarithm, you go back to the addition of a noise, but be careful, uh, the distribution is not Gaussian. It's called fischer tippett just forget it, but just is not Gaussian. Okay, I will not uh, take too much time um, on this part, but you have the same model for interferometric data, polarimetric data, so you have some distribution that have been established by Goodman, right? But this time, instead of being between the intensity and the reflectivity, they are between the vector of complex number and the covariance matrix, right? You remember I've said what is interesting for you is a covariance matrix, and you see all the distribution here, they will depend of this covariance matrix, which is called sigma. So it's just the same as before, except that you have much more uh, dimensions in your problem, let's say, right? So I, I skip a little bit this part. So here is my take-home message for this part. Uh, in fact, if you are dealing with SAR images, the noise is different because it is multiplicative. What does it mean? It means that if you compute the variance locally, the brighter the image, the higher the variance, right? Beca because you have a multiplication, right? It's not the case for optical image. Even if you have some noise on an optical image, usually it's the same everywhere. With a SAR image, the brighter, the noisier, if you want. Okay. Uh, okay, another point is that there are many you know, signal processing when doing the SAR acquisition. You know, I've said, okay, we have the synthetic aperture that is created, but there is also some apodization that is put to reduce the bright points that you have in urban areas. So what does it mean? It means that there is a small correlation between the pixel and the pixel surrounding a pixel, right? So that's something we should keep in mind also. But Okay, the noise is different, the content is different. The dynamic of the SAR image is much higher than the optical, multispectral, hyperspectral images. I mean, you have very small value and very, very bright value. I mean, that just like having a high dynamic range, let's say, but it's not uh, for natural images. Uh, but also the appearance of the image is different. You see there are many bright points, there are many bright lines, I mean, it's not at all like even a panchromatic image. Okay, what about taking the logarithm? Well, it's a good idea. It has many advantages. It makes the noise additive. It stabilizes the variance, meaning that the, now the variance is the same everywhere in your image. We will see that in the practical work, but be careful. Does not make the noise Gaussian distributed, right? because it's not symmetric for the distribution, and it's not so easy to apply it directly to the uh, polarimetric interferometric data, of course. To take the logarithm, you have to take a uh, matrix uh, logarithm. Okay, so now what about uh, deep learning to help us to reduce this uh, strong noise that we have in the SAR images, right? So I just would like to show you that it it's really brings uh, very efficient tools to, you know, to reduce the noise that you have on the SAR image, right? And I'm trying to illustrate some different strategies that you could use 
to to exploit deep learning approaches to to uh, reduce the speckle noise. So here is just some historical um, illustration of all the methods that have been proposed to reduce the speckle on SAR images. So uh, the simplest thing is just to, to do what is called multi-looking. You take many, well, a small window of pixel and you average all of them, and of course that will reduce the noise because it reduces the variance, right? And then you have a second family of approaches that everything related to variational approaches. Okay, so people, they are trying to combine some fidelity towards the data and some regularization on the resulting image, right? So they are doing a combination of regularization and respect of the input information. And the third family, of course, I would focus on this one, is the deep learning one. I'm just very briefly <laughs> say a few words about the other ones. So first strategy, you just average some samples. Around each pixel, you do some averaging. That will reduce the noise, right? That's a good strategy. But of course, if you have an age here, when you are applying your Gaussian uh, window filtering, of course, you will uh, uh, mixed the information on this part and the information on the other part. So if you have ages, if you have local information, doing spatial averaging is just destroying some information. You, you are losing resolution when you do these kind of things. All right, so then uh, people have uh, improved this method. Instead of taking you have a pixel, instead of taking the pixel around to do an averaging, you are trying to find candidates to do the averaging elsewhere in the image, right? And to find the good pixel, this one, this one, this one, for instance, you are comparing patches around the pixel, right? So you do not say anymore that the pixel to be averaged, they are locally around my pixel. They could be anywhere in the image, but I have to find them, and the right way to find them is to use the small patches. It's what is called non-local means, everything related to patch comparison. It was very efficient, but anyway, deep learning methods are even better. I'm just saying a word about the variational approaches, because that's uh, the uh, level uh, number, well, the, that's one way of introducing deep learning methods very easily. What is the idea of variational approaches? Is that you, okay, you, you have a, an image, okay, why? It is your noisy image, right? And you would like to find a new image, which is X, okay, and this image, X, um, you're looking for it in, in the world of images, Okay, and to find the right image, you're trying to minimize an energy. Okay, a functional if you want. Okay, and this energy is uh, split in two terms. This one, which is just using the Goodman model I've shown you before. It's just saying, okay, if I have a dark value in my noisy image, probably I also have a quite dark value in my... Uh, filtered image, okay? And if I have a bright value, probably I also have a bright value, okay? So it's just something that tell you, okay, you should respect the image that you are starting from. And then there is another term, which is called the regularization, which is trying to inject some prior information about images. And in particular, it's just saying that images, they are not noisy, okay? They have flat areas, and you don't have fluctuations everywhere. So this regularization information is trying to inject the knowledge that you do not have so much variation in images. Okay, if you take a natural image or a denoised image, you should not have so many uh, small fluctuation, high frequency information everywhere. Okay, so let's have a look. So here, you see, you, you have this uh, term which is trying to tell you that you should respect the 
information, the noisy information that you have. And this regularization is telling you, okay, you should have very s a small amount of fluctuation in the resulting image, okay? So you have the Y information and you are looking for X information. So let's take a very simple example. I have a noisy value, so I have just this information and I have an image only with two pixels, okay? That's a very toy uh, situation. So I have my pixel i and my pixel j, and I'm looking, uh, I have the information of uh, the new value for the j pixel, which is xj, and I'm looking for this value, okay? So I'm trying to find xi, okay? So you just apply what I've said here. You are trying to minimize this information minus the logarithm of the probability of the noisy value, knowing the denoise value, plus some regularization information. And you see this regularization information, just trying to say, oh, you, you know, you, you have this information, this value, it should be close to this one. Okay, it's, it's clear for you, the energy? It's just, you are looking for xi value, okay? that is close to the noisy value, which is yi, that I have represented here, but which is also close from this xj value, which is the value of the neighboring pixel. Okay, of course, it's a other simple situation because I just have two pixels, and I know, of course, the noisy value, and in this situation, I also know the value of the uh, denoised uh, neighboring pixels. But you see here, if you plot this information with the Goodman model, you see that you have, of course, if you have uh, no regularization, you will, of course, uh, only have the likelihood information, so you will obtain this information. And if you don't have this information, you will end up with this solution. So you see you have a solution where you are keeping the noisy value, or having only the value of the neighboring pixel, right? That, that's the two extreme situation. And of course, in between, you have a compromise between the regularization, regularization is this one, and the data fidelity information, which is this one, okay? And the variational approaches, they are trying to find a compromise between being faithful to the noisy information and respecting some regularization in the image, okay? But you see, it's not convex function, so it's not so easy to do the optimization, so people will develop some strategy to be able to do efficiently the optimization of this information. Okay, so I'm just skipping the different way. So now let's move to these uh, different uh, approaches, okay? so. We have three family of approaches to apply deep learning methods to uh, the reduction of speckle. So the first family is what is called plug and play methods, which means that we will use the variational framework that I've shown to you before, and I will replace the regularization information by some neural network that has been trained on natural images and that will be not so bad, right? So you are using the Goodman model, well, I mean the statistics that we've seen before for the fidelity term, and you are just plugging some regularization that you have learned on natural images, okay? That's the level uh, zero strategy. But then we can use a usual way of uh, doing the noising with uh, deep learning approaches is we are trying to create pairs of images, a noisy image, a ground truth. We give that to the network and we train the network to be able, starting from a noisy image, to give a ground truth image. Okay, but you see here, the problem with the supervised approach is that we need to have ground truth images. Okay, meaning that we need to have images, SAR images, 
without speckle. And okay, I will show you some idea to create these ground truth images, but that's not a perfect way of uh, because we don't really have ground truth SAR images. Okay. And the last uh, family, of course, is the uh, more efficient, but it's sometimes not so easy, is to have unsupervised method. You only have noisy images, but you are able to train the network. I think uh, Michael uh, spoke about self-supervision method. That, that this kind of approaches, uh, I mean the same idea behind that you only have the data, noisy information, and you try to formulate the problem so that you can learn some intrinsic representation that will give you some denoised information. Okay, so I will show you example in the free family. Of course, the most interesting uh, part is the last one. But okay, we will see, for the last one, we will see three different ways of solving the problem, right? Do you have any questions at this point? Okay, so... Something I will not really discuss here is the network architecture. I'm mostly interested in the strategy, let's say. Of course, the better the architecture, the better the results. And, uh, but I will discuss a little bit the loss that you have to use to do the training of the network, okay? Because it will depend of the formulation of the problem that you will use, right? Okay. So here you have the different families that we have. So that the level zero, you just use a pre-trained network. Level one is okay. You are trying to use supervised training by creating some ground truth information. And the first strategy is self-supervised method, right? Which are even nicer because you don't need to, to build this ground truth, okay? Okay, so for the pre-trained network, it's very simple here. I will use some network, right? I just plug a regularization coming from a deep neural network. Okay, so how, how is it done? Usually it's done through variable splitting. Okay, and this kind of optimization, you see you will have three different steps, okay? And these steps, it is just some Gaussian denoising, right? And we have plenty of Gaussian denoiser which have been uh, provided by people from computer vision, so I just can take one of them and put it in my algorithm, right? So I'm, I'm not using my SAR knowledge at this step. I am using my SAR knowledge at this one, right? Because here you see I have the Goodman model, the one we've shown before, the statistics of SAR images, okay? So here, you use computer vision guys, okay, that are working on denoising of video or whatever. Here you are using your SAR knowledge. You just combine everything and that gives you some results, okay? Okay, so here you have the noisy image, here you have the estimated reflectivity I show you in a few minutes uh, a bigger result. What is nice with this framework is that you can apply it if you have interferometric images, polarimetric images, multi-channel complex images, right? I don't describe it, but you just have to take a matrix logarithm and you will have a nice framework to do the denoising, okay? Okay, so here is an example. So you have, maybe we can, so here you have the noisy image on the, on the left, and you have the restored reflectivity. So of course you have a regularization from some Gaussian denoiser. So you see that you have a strong reduction of the speckle, but okay, the preservation of the different structure is maybe not, okay, perfect, let's say. But anyway, you, you, you have a strong denoising, and what is important is that you can apply it on the polarimetric channel just with the same framework by calling a Gaussian denoiser, okay? And you can also apply it on interferometric information and you see 
that, for instance, for the phase, you have a strong improvement of the phase information by using a denoiser on this kind of images. Okay? So it, it's the same framework. Uh, you, you can have a deeper look on the results and we can discuss if you want. Because you can have any number of channels in, in this kind of uh, algorithm, you can just use uh, Polinsar uh, images, okay? So meaning that this time you have six uh, channels, six complex channels as input to the network, and you will have the restoration of this different uh, information at the same time. Okay, so that was just using a Gaussian denoiser inside a statistical, uh, adapted, statistically adapted uh, framework. Okay, so maybe uh, quickly, what can we do for supervised learning? Do you, do you have any uh, idea how I could find ground truth images for my SAR images? I mean, SAR images without noise, yes? Yes, so that could be one solution. We could uh, average, uh, well, do some degradation, for instance, by just uh, Averaging many pixels, we will have a lower resolution image, but without noise, because the more pixels you average, the less noise you have, okay? So that's one way. But you see, doing the averaging, you are um, destroying a little bit the real information that you had, and if you want to recover information at one meter resolution, if you have created images at 10 meter resolution, uh, the, 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 the network will not learn uh, the, the right uh, content that you have in the SAR image, okay? So what you would have to do is to use airborne SAR, for instance, at 10 centimeters to create images at one meter if you are interested in one meter resolution, right? But, okay, other ideas, but uh, anyway, that's an idea. Yeah, sorry. Yes, but how do you... Now is more than one, and we can provide the model. Okay, but what you need is to have an image with uh, almost no noise? Uh, no, it doesn't need to have an uh, image. Just we need a value. Yes, you need the reflectivity value for what yes. you said, but you have to have an estimation of that. If, if your aim is to provide uh, images without any fluctuation for measurement, physical measurements, how do you, okay, you, you can wait for This is the major problem of INSAR. Uh, if you want, uh, you don't want to use the, uh, any GCP, any infield situation, uh, it is not acceptable. And in all the papers and all the reviewers, all the experts, Professor Hanson, uh, more or less 22 years ago say, INSAR is good, but without validation is not good. Uh, yes, all but here all I'm, I'm just <laughs> speaking about speckle reduction, so I'm even not speaking about interferometry, INSAR, and so forth. And f if you are just interested in the reflectivity, uh -huh. you can at least use, I think, what was your idea, just to average images, at least to have a kind of ground truth image. Yes. Okay, so that's, that's one solution, okay? You can just wait because the satellite is coming back again and again on the same track. But wh what is the problem if I do that? It's if it's changing on the ground, when I do the averaging, I'm not really estimating a good reflectivity. You, you agree with that? Okay, but anyway, that, that could be one way to do that. So, okay, I think with the course, course of Michael, you already know. So theta will be my parameters. Here is a noisy image, here is a ground truth image, and all the question is how can I compute some ground truth image? Okay, so here we can try to do that. So we, we take many images, we do some multi-temporal averaging, right? And then we will simulate some noisy images uh, just by, multiplica by multiplication by the noise that I've shown you before, and I will have some pairs of noisy and denoised images, 
right? And then I can train a network to do the denoising. Okay? So, yeah. Can we consider the noisy image that we have as the ground truth and we add more noise to this image to, simu uh, to simulate kind of a more noisier image? Then we try to denoise the uh, image that contains higher noise to get back to the noisy image that we have at the start. I, I will show you something which is close to what you are proposing, but I'm, I, I, we have to, to do the calculation, but the statistics that you will obtain by multiplicating the noise by the noise would not be the right noise. Okay. You, is it clear what I'm saying? Yeah, thanks. Okay, that, okay I, I understand your idea. I will show you something which is in, in, in this direction, but doing the multiplication, it's not working because you, you see, you have the speckle distribution. You have a random variable. You multiply by the random variable with the same distribution, but the resulting distribution is not the right one. OK. OK, but here, uh, OK, at least we can create this ground truth by multi-temporal averaging, multiply by noise, and train a network. What is the problem with this strategy is that you remember I told you that there are some specific um, processing by the space agency when they provide you an image. Okay, they are doing some apodization. They are doing some zero padding because of the sampling of the image. And all this processing, they will modify the correlation of the noise in the image, right? So if you are just multipli uh, multiplying pixel by pixel with the noise, you will not respect exactly the distribution in the noise in the real image, right? Okay, so anyway, you can do that, and you will obtain this kind of result, and that's not satisfactory, because to be sure that the speckle is decorrelated, you have to reduce the resolution. So that will give you some blurred image, okay? If for those who are interested, I, I, would exp I could explain later, but I want to <laughs> keep time for Emmanuel. Uh, but anyway, let's move to, to the better, uh, to some uh, more efficient strategy, which are the self-supervised training strategy. So I will keep, skip this one, but I will explain the two other strategies. Okay, so the first one is the one that you are approximately proposing, which is just using noisy images, right? So it has been proposed in a very famous paper which is called noise to noise. And in this paper, they have shown that you don't need ground truth images, right? If you just have noisy images, at least pairs of noisy images, you can train the network, okay? So what you do is you give to the network a noisy image as input, is trying to predict something, and you evaluate, you supervise the output of the network with another noisy image. Right? So you, had, you, you just have noisy image in, in, your, in your network. Okay? And it will just give you results which are as good as the one that you would obtain by using a noisy image and a ground truth image to do the, the supervision. Okay? You don't need the ground truth image to do the supervision. You can just do the supervision with a noisy image. Okay? So it's what is uh, explained in this... Uh, in this thing. So maybe just to, to show you here, you have the, the, you have the loss that you are trying to, to minimize. If you have the ground truth, that's the function that you are evaluating. And if you have only noisy information, so here you are optimizing in this way, and then you are optimizing in this way, but in average, what you will obtain is exactly the same minimum as if you have the ground truth image, right? Because the network is trying to predict something, and each time it only has some over noise realization to, to lead uh, its uh, choice, right? So the only solution is that in average, it will go toward the expectation of the noisy image, okay? So you can just apply this framework. So you take the ground truth image, you create two noisy image, and you use the second one 
to control the output of the network. Okay, so the question is, when you are using SAR images, how can you have two noisy image? Okay, so the answer again is you just take a new acquisition of a SAR image by just waiting for a new temporal acquisition. But again, one of the problems that you may have is that you have changes between the two acquisitions. So to solve this problem, either you try to control to have a very reduced time between the two acquisitions. That's a simple way to do that. A uh, more efficient solution is to correct the changes that you have in the second image so that it looks like the first one. It's a new noise realization of the speckle, but the content is the same as the first image. Okay? And to do that, what you will do is that you will subtract the information of the uh, second image, add the information of the first image as approximation, and you will have compensated for the change that you may have between the two images. Okay? So I, I don't describe things in details, but you, you have the codes uh, on the GitHub page, page and also the, the paper that is describing the different steps to do uh, in a smart way the change compensation. I just show you some results. So here uh, you have a denoise result of the image on the left. So you see this time, okay, maybe it's blurred for you, but you see it's very noisy on the, on the left. And uh, we did not lose resolution because we have only used real images. So the correlation, we don't mind this time. Even if we have correlation, spatial correlation of the noise, there will be no influence in the denoising results, right? Uh, and, uh, okay, we have put the weights of the network and it's also working for things that maybe interest more people, which is GRD uh, products. And in this case, you also have a good uh, restoration of the information that you have in the image. Okay, I just take, uh, so I skip uh, this uh, part. I would just like to, to show you this uh, method because I think it's a very, very nice way of uh, training the network because you just use one SAR image to do the training. You see here, I had to have one first date and a second date, and I used both of them to do the training. Of course, at the end, I have the denoising of just one image, but to train the network, I had to have two images. This time, you can just train the network with one image, okay? And how is it possible? Uh, it's possible because you can decompose the information that you have in the image between the real part and the imaginary part. And that's not a very intuitive uh, solution. Because you see, if you have a look to the face of a single star image, you have almost no information in this, uh, in this phase. Okay, so it's a little bit surprising that the fact that you have the face, in fact, it's a way of splitting the information that you have in a complex field of the star image. You put the real part on one side, you put the imaginary part on the other side, and you will do exactly noise to noise but by feeding the network with the real part and controlling and supervising the network with the imaginary part, right? So, nice thing, because you don't need to have pairs of uh, multi-temporal images. You have plenty of single looks or image, so you can train your network with plenty of images, right? So, it's a very, very nice idea. Why is it working? It's working because the distribution of the real part, well, the real part as a random variable is independent from the imaginary part seen as a random variable. Okay, and that's Goodman model that is giving you this information. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that here I have the real part, I put it in my despeckling network, it's trying to give me an estimation which is the error this information here. Okay. And to check what is, well, to, to do the optimization of the loss, to do the training of my network, 
What I will evaluate is exactly this loss, which is uh, the estimated reflectivity, where you take the logarithm plus uh, this information, which is your imaginary part. You take the square of it and you divide by the reflectivity, and that will be the loss that will be optimized by the network. Okay? So you see, you have no ground truth, you have no second image to do the training, you have just split real part, imaginary part, and you can just train the network with as many images as you have in your database, right? Okay, so, and when you are uh, in testing time, you will do an estimation with the real part, you will do an estimation with the imaginary part with the same network. I mean, it's completely symmetric, the behavior of the real part and the imaginary part. You can just combine them to have the final, final estimation. Okay? So you have two uh, estimation of the reflectivity and you just average to have the result. But it's the same network. I mean, you have just done the training one time. So I show you an example. So here is the real part. So you see, it's a little bit surprising because the real part is even noisier than the image on the left. Okay, because you have half of the information. Okay, but here is the estimation that is provided by this image. And here you have the imaginary part and here is the estimation that you have just using the imaginary part. And when you combine them, you obtain the final estimate that is given here. Okay, so what is nice is that it's completely self-supervised. You don't need any external information to do the training. If you have a new sensor, you can do the training. Whatever the apodization that is applied to the SAR image, you just don't mind because it will not modify the independence between the real part and the imaginary part. Okay? So, I will, uh, so here is another example of this kind of strategy. You can apply it also on Ariol uh, sensor. Here is Onera sensor city. And you also can do this framework in, uh, by using, um, sorry, by using multi-temporal images, but I don't have time to discuss this point. So I will just uh, say a few words of conclusion on this uh, on this slide. So uh, it's quite important to take into account the statistics that you have uh, in the SAR image when you want to reduce the speckles that you have in this image. So the first point is that try to use the statistical models that have been established a long time ago by Goodman because that's a very basic, uh, uh, well, I mean, well-adapted distributions, at least to have a first approximation of the, of the speckle. And then you have plenty of strategies to be able to exploit uh, the diversities that you may have in the data. So the first strategy we've seen is to use temporal diversity. You just take two images and you just train the network with this temporal diversity. So be careful, you have to do either a change detection, either a change compensation. I've not described this one, but it has been uh, studied by some Italian team, Molini and so forth, using the spatial diversity, meaning that you are masking some of the pixel to do the estimation of one pixel. Uh, but a very interesting diversity is a real and imaginary part which will give you a very simple way of training the network because you are supervising the network by the imaginary part and giving as input, for instance, the real part. Uh, just the, some, there is no really pre-processing, but you have to have a centered spectrum to be able to do this kind of strategy to be sure that you have independence between the real part and the imaginary part because if they are correlated, of course, the network will use the correlation to do the prediction. Okay, so I finish here, but if you have any questions, of course, we'd be happy. But anyway, we will have the practical work. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah?
Thanks for your presentation. It was uh, very clear. I would like to ask you if the networks are pre-trained, and if they are pre-trained, on which data set? Um, they are not pre-trained. Well, I mean, well, for instance, for the temporal diversity, they are pre-trained with synthetic speckle. OK? And then they are fine-tuned to be robust to the spatial correlation that you have because of the apodization that is applied by the space agency when producing the images. So you train from scratch with random yeah. initialization. OK, yeah. thanks. But of course, we, you, can, you, know, you can synthesize plenty of images if you are using synthetic speckle on that. You can always uh, uh, create ground truth images by averaging very long time theory of images. That, that's no, uh, it, it's not very costly. Well, they, they, we are providing them on the website if you, if you need some ground truth images. The problem is that these ground truth images, if you multiply them by speckle, you are not taking into account the uh, transfer function that you have of the specific sensor that you will use at the end. And what happens is that this transfer function, it is correlating a little bit the speckle. So if you have trained the network without any correlation with a white speckle, and you apply it with a spatially correlated speckle, it will create some artifacts because it will think that the correlation is linked to the content and not to the noise, right? Well, you, you can try it. <laughs> you, you will see it's like spaghetti in the, in the results. OK, thanks. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for your presentation. If Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, can you speak loudly? If, uh, if we have, uh, for example, 50 images, 50 yeah. star images, yeah. and uh, some, uh, some of uh, package an application to process time series of star images, such as PI GMT star, uh, work on the RAR file, which directly we downloaded from the ESA website. OK? Yeah. Now, uh, each one by each one, we uh, use the, this type of methodology mm -hmm. and uh, remove the noise. And uh, how we can imp uh, input this to our package to uh, start the analysis of time series? Because we have to open this from the RAR file. Uh, I know. The, <laughs> Do you have any solution for this or no? Uh, I, I think that's a real, uh, well, that's, there is a real gap between us, which are working on signal image processing side, and we are really using the single look complex images to derive exactly, the new SLC type, respecting yes. methods. And people working on the GRD images and uh, things like that. And well, where that's why, for instance, star to star we have developed a version for uh, GRD images. But if we really want, for instance, to use this uh, imaginary real part denoising things, some of the packages they have to be adapted to to be able to. Well, no, maybe we have to modify the uh, package. Example, there is are. some work to do. Yes. We we have work to release some uh, codes for Sentinel One. We we are trying to work in this direction, but I mean, you know, we are more on the. You know, publishing papers. I'm I'm not a space agency, so <laughs> no. But I, <laughs> but I know it's a, it's a pity that some of the methods we develop they could uh -huh. not really be used because if people have a very big amount of data, they could not afford of downloading the image, doing things on the single look complex image. But that's a pity because that's really working very well. I'm I must say. So uh, I don't know. We can discuss about solutions, but uh, yes. I don't have any and for the moment. Uh, we manually, we we have already spoken a lot about this kind of. And things, we can use this for uh, other type of star images, for example, Cosmos Sky. Yes, the, 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 there is because no the problem. What we have done is to put the weight of the training network for some of the sensor we had. We have put for. TerraSarix uh, Spotlight Mode, TerraSarix uh, Strip Map Mode. We have uh -huh. put the code of SAR to SAR, which is a temporal method. Well, I mean, it's not temporal, but it's just temporal for the training. It's not temporal at all after. But SAR to SAR, we have provided the code so for okay. Strip Map and GRD mm. because we have uh, worked on a, 
uh, detection of rivers and the people who are using GRD images. We, we are interested in collaborating with thematic people, but I mean, <laughs> we are yeah. using, uh, you know, single low compact images. But anyway, we put the code. Cosmos Skyman, we did not uh, do any training. Cosmos Skyman but, but is like the Terrasarix is .h5. Is .h5 format and it is okay. If you work with Terrasarix, we can work with uh, Cosmos Sky also yes, because yeah, it's the same uh, format. Anyway, I think we've put the Python um, notebook to be able to do the training. Not the training, but the fine-tuning. Ah, Ah, okay, yes. thank you very ah, much. Okay. Anyway. Any other questions? Uh, I was wondering if you can just uh, re-explain a bit what you said about the effect of the processing done by the, the space agency for the products are? Well, you... You, you see, uh, here is a single look image, okay? And here is the spectrum if, if you compute the Fourier transform of the complex image, right? And you see, well, it's, it's in reverse gray level, but it's, it's having like a humming apodization. And you know, we have this humming apodization because people are trying to, to reduce the secondary lobe of the sink, the cardinal scene that you have for very strong targets. Okay, the, you, you see this uh, cross signature that you have in our image. To reduce them, you will put some apodization in the spectrum, right? So, of course, you can suppress this apodization, but that will bring, bring back this uh, cross. And if you train a network, with images with this spectrum, but with a white speckle noise, it, the, the, the network will not understand that this apodization induces some spatial correlation of the noise. Okay, so you have a white noise. A white noise, it means that it's completely independent from one pixel to the other, and you have a real sensor where you have a correlation between the speckle at this pixel and the four nearest neighbors. And the network, and that's, well, be careful if you take a network that has been trained for white noise, even speckle noise, and you apply it on real image, it will create artifacts in flat areas because it's not understanding that there is this apodization because it has never seen it in, in the training. That's why this SAR to SAR method, it's robust against this spatial correlation because it's only trained with images that has seen this correlation. And for this method, which is called Merlin, this method is also robust because the real part and the imaginary part, they are still independent, even if there is this spatial correlation. Is that clear?